So uh, as we uh, continue our lesson series here, we've been for some time talking about looking forward. And, you know, we've talked about looking forward with emphasis on the job of the individual. What, what does the individual Christian uh, do? What should be expected of the individual Christian? And, and, you know, what is our task from day to day? We talked about that. And then we discussed the work of the local church. And we talked about church structure as well. You know, the way that the the Lord desires that his church be structured and how, how, it, is to be, uh, how it is to be run uh, as, as he desires. You know, and as we know from 1 Timothy that, you know, that in the, very, the first century church, uh, it was said about it that some things were lacking. You know, in Titus 1 uh, verse 5, let's go over there to, to Titus and just kind of... Uh, remind ourselves uh, in Titus 1 at verse 5 it says for this reason and this is Paul speaking for this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you and then it moves on to talk about some of the, the qualifications for that office of bishop or elder and along the way as well uh, to be uh, to be correct, in order for a church to be scripturally organized, that uh, things would not be lacking, we also uh, see a need for deacons in the church. And so, as we are looking forward ourselves individually, as we are looking forward ourselves, you know, as a local assembly of the Lord's church. And as we are looking forward and comparing the structure of the Lord's church here with what we find in the scriptures, we need to think about these things. You know, we mentioned in the Bible study time this morning that in order for us to, to really come to an understanding of what the Lord desires in our lives, we have to know what the scriptures say what the Lord desires of us. And then when we come to the knowledge of that and we understand what the Lord desires, then we have to think critically and, and apply those things to our lives. And that, that in effect, is, is what separates the saved from the unsaved. You know, it's, it's not enough just to know, but also to put in place those things that the Lord desires in, in each of our lives, individually, with our obedience to the gospel of Christ. Uh, and then when it comes to his church, you know, we, we also want to be those that, that uh, have thought about his desire and taken action in that regard. Now, it uh, is well understood uh, that, you know, as I'm speaking to you now, uh, you know, it might just not be possible among this local assembly of saints to to have deacons tomorrow and as the next lesson uh, that I'm planning will deal with elders and it may not be uh, possible for us to immediately have elders but I, I bring this subject up again uh, as I have in the past in the three plus years uh, that I've stood before you uh, so that we can look forward so that we can think towards such things because as we see there in uh, the book of Titus you know it, it, as Paul was speaking there were things that were lacking and 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 we also must look and think in that direction now in 2nd Peter 3 14 as we've read several times uh, in this series of lessons uh, therefore beloved looking forward to these things be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless now that's our whole goal that's why we talk about the these things that's why we come together as it has been commanded you know we're here because it is commanded but also we're here because we want to be diligent uh, if you're here because somebody dragged you here because you feel some compulsion to be here because uh, of pleasing some human being then you're doing it wrong. 
the the whole idea behind you know faith in the Lord is that you understand deep within yourself, within your soul, within your mind, within your heart, that you understand who the Lord is. And because of that, you want to exercise that diligence to be what the Lord desires, that, uh, that you take it seriously, that uh, these decisions that you make on this side of the grave, you know, they have everything to do with where you're going to spend eternity on the other side of the grave. So these are things that are important to think about. Nothing that you don't already know uh, in, in most cases. Now, now let's look at the job of deacons and a spiritual need for them, the scriptural need for them. In Philippians 1 at verse 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, and I point that, I point that scripture out just simply to look at the context it points out the context uh, of the Lord's church at that point in time. That letter is being written very simply to who? To the overseers, the elders, and to the deacons. So we have an example, a uh, first century example there in Philippians of there being elders and there being deacons. Otherwise the letter would have been addressed to Bob and whoever else. You know, so there, are, there were the elders and the deacons. And that's just very simply uh, what we can gain from that, from that, simple, from that simple statement. You know, there's no doubt that deacons are needed in the church. And I think, uh, you know, oftentimes that, that thought kind of gets lost, uh, goes by the wayside. But the Lord was very orderly in his establishing of, of everything. I mean, look around you, look at creation. We have snowflakes falling out the window, as I can see right now, uh, falling outside the window. And if you were to catch one on your coat sleeve and look at it, and you look at the intricate design, the way that the Lord has designed water molecules, when they freeze, coming down through the air, that they make those wonderful designs that we see. When you look at the orderliness of the seasons, it is no surprise that in Ohio in March that we would see snow outside the window. It is accepted that that's part of the normal way of things with creation. And the Lord designed things in a very orderly manner. He, he didn't cut corners with his church. He also made a design that he expects us to carry out uh, with, his, with his church, his bride. Uh, to look at the word that, that is used in the scriptures and, uh, for deacon, and diac I'm going to say this wrong, diaconio, to serve, means caring for the needs of others as the Lord guides in an active and practical way. Now that's the definition from Help's word study. Uh, I thought that it, captured, it was concise and it captured the idea of, of the word. Uh, without getting too verbose there. So, uh, very simply, to care for the needs of others as the Lord guides in an active and practical way. The physical needs of the church. You know, we are physical beings. We occupy a physical space as we are, as we are here and as we go, out, go about through our lives. And as such, we have to take care of the physical things. You know, we're going to have a meeting here uh, after services today to talk in, in, in some part about the physical needs of this assembly here and you know the direction in which we need to go to, to rectify some, some of those things. I, uh, you know, may, maybe there's a plumbing issue. Maybe there's a, something that's going on that needs to be addressed. And this would be the job of those that would be in the play, in the, in the role of a deacon in the Lord's church. Not to oversee things, but to actively serve the church. Now, many times, perhaps as you're raising children, if you've had <clears throat> the privilege of raising children, uh, perhaps you've heard, or maybe if you haven't, maybe you've just heard the term that it takes a village to raise a child. You know, every, everybody that, that comes into the, the uh, life of that child, you know, has some part in raising it. And in a like manner, when we think about the Lord's church, 
to be successful, to do the things that the Lord has desired of his people, this is part of it. That there be those that, that take it upon themselves to do the, the everyday, perhaps mundane activities uh, that are involved with, uh, with just having a group of physical group of people that come together. There are needs that arise. And uh, those that are to serve the church. Now, each and every one of us as, as uh, saints, as brethren, you know, we also have this charge to us, too, that we, that we should serve each other, that we should look out for each other, that we should step in and help out where needed. But uh, nonetheless, we have an example of those that specifically had that, that purpose called out to them. Uh, from among the brethren to do to do such things in the in the local church and in our diligence as as those that are seeking to be in heaven with uh, with the Lord after this life we, we want to exercise diligence in the way that we want to prepare for such a thing and we want to look forward to such a thing the work of a deacon edifies the church it builds up the church you now first Timothy 3 at verse 13. Let's, let's go over there. 1 Timothy 3 and at verse 13. <clears throat> for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write to you though I hope to come to you shortly. So you know, those that, that, that uh, carry out and serve as a deacon and serve well, you know, they, they, gain a, they gain some trust of, of the brother. They show themselves to be trustworthy. They gain for them a good reputation. And, and this is something that is important amongst the brethren. I mean, we... <clears throat> We all should, of course, be a, striving to have a good reputation am, uh, amongst everybody that we come into contact with, but especially uh, of those of the household of faith. You know, when, uh, we, when we serve well, uh, and speaking of the statement there in the scriptures, for those who have served well as deacons, it lends to the idea that we should take that seriously. To serve well, to do anything well, you have to put some thought to it. You know, even if, even if you're going to apply yourself to mowing the grass, you have to apply yourself to do that well. You know, I learned from my neighbor growing up uh, that you don't just take the mower anywhere you want and across the grass. He taught me how to mow in a straight line and to, uh, to, to mow around objects that you come about in the yard and, and how to make that look good. And uh, there, there's a... There's, when there's work to be done, there's work to be done well. You know, and follow it, when we follow the Lord's plan, when we follow what the scriptures dictate as far as the Lord's church, something happens. The work gets done. The church is stronger for it, and the deacon is stronger for it as well. Those that undertake such a role, you know, they, they, they learn and get stronger all the while as they're as they're doing these things you know it's often said of and anybody who has put together a lesson and taught a lesson understands the concept that that nobody learns more than the person that is bringing forth the lesson you know as you prepare and and and, and think about the things that you're going to say and you study the scriptures to to find out those things that you're going to be presenting you know, you learn so much along the way, so much more than, than we can possibly do just sitting on a bench. Uh, you know, and, and that's, uh, you know, we all can't get up and, and preach to each other here today. It would be chaotic. So just, I'm not putting down uh, anybody who is sitting on the bench here today, but uh, it just stands to reason by human ability and human nature that nobody's going to learn more than the person who's who's teaching because they've they've they know what they're they're they're, go, they're going to present and they've had time to mull on those things you get the the fleeting seconds that 
that the words come out of my mouth or that are up on the screen. Uh, so just by the virtue of that, by applying that effort, you learn more. And that should be something that, that, should be something that each and every one of us wants to do. Uh, as we think about the things that need to get done on a daily basis, in your family, you probably have some sort of plan as to how that's going to be, how that's going to take place. In my family, Angela, when there's shopping to be done, she'll make a list and I'll go down that list and go to the store and get those things. Uh, without that list, I come home with things that aren't on the list, <laughs> that shouldn't be on the list. I come home with things that uh, she wanted that I didn't, that I forgot because of my fallible mind. And we all have a fallible mind in our, in our heads. And as we uh, do the, Lord, the, the work of the Lord's church, we also want to set forth with a plan that the Lord has instituted. We want to be those that, we want to be those that do what the Lord has asked. I turn your attention for a, a quick moment to Acts 6, the first six verses there. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, and this is verse 1 of Acts 6, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. So, we have the example of something needed to be done. And those that, you know, the, the apostles, those that, those that were in charge, the overseers of, the, of, of that gathering, they, they had a job to do. And as we understand, if we stretch ourselves too thin, you know, things get done halfway. And, uh, you know, we, I, I come out of, I come out of, you know, as all of you well know, uh, come out of owning a business for years, and, and uh, it, I understand being stretched thin. I understand trying to do the job of, of a couple of people, and uh, it doesn't work too well. And it doesn't work too well for very long. It doesn't uh, serve anybody well if you stretch yourselves too thin. And, and I think often happens in the Lord's churches, sometimes... Uh, you know, a few stretch themselves really thin to make things work. And it's not out of any kind of uh, necessarily laziness on the part of others. It's just, a, it's just that there hasn't been a, a, a concentrated effort to, to do things in an organized manner that would alleviate such, such things. So there's a need for deacons in the church. Long story short there. As we see, it was true in the first century Human beings haven't changed. The church has not changed. The same things are apply to us here today, and, and we should not be surprised that, well, here today, you know, the same things are needed. So as we look at deacons, just as we're going to look at elders, uh, you know, saints, even saints in the Lord's church, there are, there are qualifications, if you will. There are things that must be done in order for anyone to be called a saint in the Lord's church to be, and that's a, a, a term I was thinking the other day, that's a term that is, that is misunderstood by society. You go out in society and call yourself a saint, people are going to get the wrong idea. Uh, there, there's some, some teaching that has to be done there. You know, if you, if you have been faithful to the Lord and been obedient to his gospel, you are a saint. You are a member of the Lord's church. You know, those that, that's what, what is meant by that, just for clarification. But, you know, there, you had to look into the word and you had to come to an understanding of who Christ is and, and understand what his will is and, and act upon that and turn away from sin. Be obedient to, uh, 
to the waters of baptism. Be, be obedient insofar as you submit to the waters of baptism. And, you know, those things are kind of maybe the qualifications, maybe we could say, for those that, that are uh, of the household of faith, the saints, the members of the Lord's church. And not just here in Medina, in this physical place, but the Lord's church as he has established it. That is not a building, that is not a physical place, but it is made up of those that have been obedient to him. So as we look at the qualifications for, for deacons, let's look at 1 Timothy, uh, starting at verse 3. and uh, I'm sorry, chapter 3, starting at verse 8. And we'll read there for a little bit. Now, we, we already read Acts 6, 1 through 6, and we kind of got a little idea of uh, what, what they were to do and so on, and, and that they were to be of good report and so on. Let's, let's read 1 Timothy 3, starting at verse 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. You know, so we see there on the screen, hope it showed up on your screen, it did. Uh, so the, the qualifications for deacons are as such, you know, they had to be of good repute. You don't want somebody that is known to be untrustworthy. You know, the, the, the physical needs of the church, uh, maybe, maybe it uh, involves using the Lord's money to, to do something that needs to be done. Well, we wouldn't want to trust the, uh, someone who was not trustworthy with, with such a thing. Uh, they, they need to be of good repute. They need to be wise in some way. You know, having, having enough wisdom to be able to act properly and to make decisions based upon the scriptures in life, in life. being dignified, you know, and this, uh, you know, also speaking of the wife of the deacon. So just by, by uh, context of that statement there, we understand that the deacon must be married, must be the husband of one wife. You know, and then there are, there are uh, you know, whenever we see a qualification like that, there, there are those that would uh, try to pick things apart. And, you know, perhaps it is, it, I've heard it said, you know, do they need to be, uh, have only been married once in their life? Well, what, what, is, what is marriage? What is marriage? And how long does it last? Ma marriage is until death do we part. So when, when uh, the wife or the husband in a, in a marriage passes away, the one that is left behind, I don't believe you can call them a husband or a wife anymore. Uh, and so I think that kind of answers the question there uh, that, that may arise when, when speaking of the husband of one wife. But we see there that the wife matters. The wife in the, in the relationship matters because the wife can be helpful or hurtful to, to, the, uh, to the work of the one that, that might desire to be a deacon. Now, not addicted to wine, and in the scriptures there we read in verse 8 of 1 Timothy 3, not addicted to much wine. So, so let's uh, explore for just a moment you know, the question that you might get. So, so that means that they can drink a little, right? That uh, and I and I I mentioned this because I think that it presents a a heart problem as we talked about in the Bible study time this morning that the ails the ills of the world would all be solved if people just took care of the heart problem that under that was underlying uh, all of the issues you know whether it be a murderer 
whether it be someone who is a thief, someone who is dishonest out in the world, if they just handled their heart problem and came to the Lord and structured their life as such, you know, those things would take care of themselves. So I want to ask, answer this with another question. You know, what, what kind of heart are we dealing with if we have a person that is looking for, you know, the limit? Okay, so I can drink this much and be okay. I can do this much drugs. You know, I, I can do this much and be okay. That's, a, that's an indicator that there's perhaps a heart problem there. So that whole idea of not being addicted to much wine, uh, it, it's a serious question. It's a serious idea that, you know, wine, first of all, and, and this is not uh, part of this lesson, and I, I will try not to uh, speak too long on it, but the wine that we see today is uh, that we could buy on the shelves at the gas station is much stronger than the wine that was used back then. And the wine was used as a purification agent. Uh, to, they didn't have water treatment plants and so on like we do today. And so there was a reason for the use of it. And it was not to use it as people use alcohol today. And so with a sober mind, with a godly outlook on being able to live your life every day uh, in serving the Lord, one who desires to be a deacon is going to look at that and make a rightful decision on whether or not they should allow such a thing into their bodies because it has an effect on their body to some degree. You know, I, I can tell you from my time teaching young people to drive, you know, part of the in-class portion of driver training had to do with alcohol because alcohol and drugs are commonly mixed with driving with a disastrous consequences. And uh, one of the things that is understood by science, by, by those that have done the, uh, carried out these tests is that alcohol has, has an effect on a, the human body from the very first sip. When you put the very first sip of alcohol in your body, there's an effect. Now, it might not be that you're, that you're uh, quote unquote drunk. It might not be that you're falling over and stumbling, but there is an effect upon your body. And that, is, in effect, is what we want to think about and understand that uh, if, we, if we are trying to draw a line and trying to say, well, okay, it says not much wine, so I, I guess I can, I can, I can drink uh, socially still. But I just won't have much. You know, that's one of those terms. Well, how much is much? How much is a little? And uh, why are you asking that question? <laughs> because the Lord, isn't, the Lord isn't desiring that any of his, whether you aspire to be a deacon, an elder, or, or not, he doesn't want his people to be those that skirt the line and say, okay, I can do this much and be safe, but if I take a step over here, I'm, I, I'm lost. He, he wants us to be seeking after him in such a way that our, our focus is on him and not on, okay, well, I can, I can skirt into this that is getting really close to sin just a little bit and I'll, and I'll be okay. That, that's not what he is desiring of his people. But anyway... Uh, along with that, along with the character traits of one who would be a deacon, and we'll see a lot of these, all of these, uh, show back up again when we talk about an elder, those who would desire the office of an elder, but, but not greedy. Now, uh, none of us should be greedy. In fact, our uh, treasure should be in heaven, not, not on this earth, and the things that moth and rust can destroy, as the scriptures tell us. It must be blameless. And now that doesn't mean that you've never done anything wrong. But uh, someone shouldn't be able to point the finger at you readily and say, okay, I know that they're into this. I know that they're into this, that, or the other thing. I've mentioned several times, uh, perhaps even last time uh, I was with you, uh, that when I first became a Christian, I was attending a different assembly of the Lord's Church and, and an older lady uh, came up and introduced herself and she had known my family name 
and uh, she came up to me and asked if I was related to my family, my, my father's family, and, and I said yes, and she said, well, you know, they were all a bunch of drunks. You know, and basically, are you a drunk? <laughs> and and uh, she wasn't wrong about those things. And, and and that's something that we should think about. You know, Ken, now, now she couldn't, I, I've never been one that, has, I, I've seen what alcohol can do to people. And from a young age, I, I, I shied away from that. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, people know what, what, uh, what, what you do and what perhaps your family does. And can people point the finger at you and say, oh yeah, they're, they steal. Oh yeah, they're dishonest. I know that they, that they, uh, th that they cheated somebody out of this, that, or the other thing. You, that's the idea of being blameless, that, you, that people can't readily point the finger at you and say, this, is, this, this person's into those things. We talked about being the husband of one wife a moment ago, and of course, you know, we understand the, the, the biology that goes on within the human body. The desire for companionship and, and, and what the purpose of marriage is. And, and perhaps we'll get into that in another lesson sometime. You know, the, the, the purpose behind marriage and, and how the Lord instituted it and what it was meant to do for mankind. And we understand we don't have to look too far in, in, in popular culture and so on to see what happens when one lives a life that, uh, that doesn't ascribe to the ideas of, of marriage, the ideals of marriage as God has put them into place. Troubles happen, and, and we need to be sure that uh, if we are in a place of uh, working in the Lord's church in such a way, you know, if you're a saint here in the Lord's church, if you're a member of the Lord's church, you also should a, a aspire to not get yourself entangled with things of the world, but more so if you're going to be in a position, uh, a, a, a formal position, if you will, in the Lord's church. And we already mentioned that a deacon's wife can help qualify or disqualify him. So as to the young people sitting in this auditorium here today, think carefully about whom you might seek to, to, to marry. Think carefully about that because that's going to have a lot to do with how your life unfolds in the future. And you need to choose not for all of the reasons that the world chooses, but because you understand that that person is going to work with you and help you get to heaven. And, and, and you know, now's the time to start if you're in a situation and, and perhaps, you know, changes can be made as far as helping your spouse that you may already be married to that perhaps isn't a Christian, taking those steps to, to help them come to that place where they can be obedient to the gospel of Christ, that they might also be able to take hold of that hope that we have in, in heaven after this life, that, that it'll put you in a place that you can be as useful as possible to the Lord's work. So that at some future time you might, you might uh, find yourself in a situation where the local church needs someone to be a deacon. And uh, your life has been so laid out according to the, what the Lord would desire of, of a person that you are then able to step into that role and serve as the Lord desires. Now that that would be something to look forward to and to seek after. You know, a, a deacon and his wife are dignified in nature, as we read there in the scriptures. You know, not, not those that, uh, that, that, again, can be pointed at and it can be said about them that, well, they get involved in all of these unseemly things over here. But, uh, but they're sure dressed nice and, you know, go to church on Sunday. We don't want it to be said about any of us those things. A deacon and his wife are sober-minded. That doesn't mean that you walk around with a grumpy look on your face all the time, but that you're serious about serious things. And there's nothing more serious than the condition of your soul and the soul of those around you. And so 
a deacon and his wife should be have their minds in such a way that they think about eternal things, that they take things seriously when things need to be taken seriously, that they handle rightly the word of God, that they, that they seek to do things well that would be pleasing in the, in the sight of the Lord. A deacon and his wife are not slanderous, uh, uh, furthermore. You know, that they, that they are not those that are backbiting and talking about other people and gossiping and all those things that we see the scriptures speaking against. Now, so as we, we look here today and we think about these, these qualifications for deacons and as we prepare our minds uh, for future lessons and we talk about the qualifications for elders as well, you know, we want to think about these things. Can, we, can you put yourself into these little boxes here and can you say... <clears throat> am I of good repute? Can you say, can it be said about you that you are wise, at least insofar as you are able, and that you make wise decisions seeking for the wisdom of the Lord, not wisdom of man? Are you dignified? Are you not double-tongued and say one thing and do another? You know, there, there's, uh, uh, the, the Lord uh, tells us, or James tells us, that, you know, a, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We, we need not be such a person. Can, can we say that we're not double-tongued? Can we say that we're not addicted to wine, even much wine? Uh, can, can, can we say that we're not greedy, that we're blameless, that we're the husband of one wife? And, and the whole idea behind the husband of one wife just to throw this out there too, is a one woman man. A person who is, is not involving himself in, in polygamy, who is not involving himself in the ways of the world that we see uh, pl plastered across our television screens and popular culture. Uh, can we say that, uh, that a deacon and his wife or someone who would desire to be a deacon and his wife uh, are, are they working together to get to heaven? Are they working together in, that, in such a way that they complement each other in that way? A deacon and his wife, are they dignified in nature? And are they sober-minded? Are they not slanderous? Those that, that have seasoned their speech with salt, who say things to build each other up, not to tear each other down. You know, those are, those are the things that we want to think about as we go through this next week. And as we go through the, the ensuing days of our lives, we want, to, we want to think about the qualifications for deacons, whether we meet them. You know, there's no doubt that the local assembly here needs deacons. You know, that's a foregone conclusion. You know, are you in a place where you can, where you can serve in that capacity? Think about that as we, as we move forward. Are you in a place where you can make decisions now that would help you be ready for that eventuality of being able to serve in some way in the Lord's church? These are all things that we want to think about. You know, not, we, we, we come together and we often think about you know, our soul. We think about the things that perhaps we've allowed in our lives and whether or not you know, we've fallen off the track as it is often said but but we also want to think about one another we want to think about this local assembly and how we can best serve each other so that we can all make it to heaven and this is part of it being uh scripturally organized at some point and be and looking out for one another in the way that the lord has clearly outlined that he desires of his people so as we think about those things and the requirements involved with deacons and elders as I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson God has requirements of all mankind there's not a person who has lived or will live on this earth that does not fall under God's commands that doesn't fall under the requirements that God has for mankind he desires that all men of course hear if we, if we are to gain faith in him, we are to hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17 tells us, of course, as we well know, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that causes us to believe. When we uh, believe that he is 
the Christ. Then we begin to act like we know who he is. And we begin to say, okay, I'm going to turn away from these things because I understand God's not happy with those things. And I'm going to walk in a new direction. I'm going to keep my eyes focused on him. And that's repentance that we see in Acts 2.38. Those that were cut to the heart and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then being able to confess Christ before men, not being ashamed. And then being baptized for the remission of sins, buried in the waters of baptism because he said so. Because that was his desire of mankind, that they submit to the baptism that he has commanded. Baptism for the remission of sins. Not to put you into membership with this local place. Not to do anything else but what God has said, what the Lord has said that it does being something that you enter into with the mind of doing it for the remission of sins and then of course remaining faithful until death have you put on christ if you haven't the waters of baptism are ready behind me here we can make that happen today if you have put on christ in baptism yet you find that you have a struggle you find that there's an issue that arises in your life you know, daily and you need the prayers of the saints. That's what we're here for. We're, I say it often and I hope, uh, I believe it and I hope you do too. And I hope we follow through, uh, continually continue to follow through with this idea of us being a family and uh, being a support to one another. And I know that you'll be there for me and, uh, you know, as a, a shoulder to cry on, uh, to Build me up. You have been, all, you know, all these years. And I hope we continue to do so. And I hope you're not afraid if you need that shoulder to cry on and that support in a time of trouble. I hope you're not afraid to come forward and, and let it be known. Whatever your need may be, please come forward as we stand and sing. <laughs>